Well, good afternoon everybody, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this meeting of the Edinburgh Sir Walter Scott Club this afternoon and to the colloquium that they're having on Quentin Durward. So it's 200 years since the publication of that novel and 200 years ago in January of 1823 Scott began a novel where he turned his attention to 15th century France and if we can imagine Scott sitting either at his desk in Abbotsford or here in Edinburgh in January, he was probably turning his mind to sunnier times and sunnier climes. But 200 years later, also in January, uh, not very much has changed, I'm afraid. But however, this afternoon we've got two speakers who are going to be exploring that novel for us, and I'm delighted to, um, to introduce both of them to you this afternoon. Now, a little bit of a change from, from the usual format, as you can probably tell, uh, one of our speakers is joining us via a video link. Um, so um, I'll introduce our first speaker and then introduce our second speaker, who I'm delighted to say is with us in the room as well. And as ever, there'll be time for questions towards the end of this afternoon's event. So, first of all, it's my delight to um, introduce Ian Alexander. Ian Alexander joined the University of Aberdeen English Department in 1968, eventually becoming emeritus reader in English. He's published many uh, studies on Scott and on Wordsworth, and he was the general editor of the Edinburgh edition of the Waverley novels from 1984 until its completion in 2012. And so without any further ado, we can hear Ian's talk just now. I was delighted when Michael Wood invited me to talk about Quentin Derbert in its bicentenary year. It immediately occurred to me that I might take as my point of departure the unusual sense most readers will probably have that this is a narrative characterised by spare, disciplined efficiency. We know that Scott had considerable difficulties in writing the previous novel, Peril of the Peak, when he was physically and mentally below par. He wrote to Daniel Terry in November 1822, I have not been very well. A wholesome thickness of blood and a depression of spirits arising from the loss of friends have annoyed me much. And Peril will, I fear, smell of the apoplexy. He hoped, as he said at the beginning of 1823, to do much better things in my next. Turning to 15th century France as virgin territory for fiction. It had taken him eight months to complete Peveril from May to December 1822 though the fourth volume, my late edition, was completed in a fortnight. By contrast, the whole of Quentin Durward took only three months. It was begun in late January 1823 and completed at the beginning of May. The first chapter of the new novel sets the prevailing tone, carefully analytical, of events and characters. After a succinct sketch of the state of France at a pivotal moment, the narrator outlines the opposed characters of Louis XI and Charles the Bold. The sense of discipline is enhanced by a new development for Scott at this period, the provision of a title as well as a motto for each chapter. The title of chapter one is The Contrast. It seems likely that the chapter titles were introduced so that they could appear as the running heads rather than as hitherto the novel's title, which was originally intended to be simply Derwood. The point was to keep the latter secret during the production period. But the device also strengthens the sense of the narrative being under control, in spite of one or two oversights in its execution. I started my recent rereading of Quentin Derwood with this memory 
of a disciplined analytical narrative in my mind. And I was interested to see if it turned out as I had remembered. Basically, it did. And if so, whether Scott's firm ordering might have consequences I had not been aware of, or not fully aware of, on previous readings. It did. As a result, I have comments to offer on the beginning of the novel, the main narrative, and the ending. Of course, the first thing I encountered in the Edinburgh edition of Quentin Durward, based on the first edition, was not chapter one, but the extensive introduction. We don't know at what stage Scott wrote the introduction. Its 18 manuscript leaves are numbered as a self-contained sequence, but that does not necessarily indicate that it was conceived after the main text was begun. There is a clear terminus ad quem. It must have been composed before the printers approached the end of the first volume, since that has only 273 pages with Arabic numerals rather than the usual 330 or so. I know many readers will skip the introduction, and as Scott was first to acknowledge, they are perfectly entitled to do so. But their experience of the novel, although valid, will be incomplete. And I take the introduction to be an integral part of the work. But though I've always included it in my readings, in the past I have not paid it as much attention as I now think it deserves. It is, of course, in a quite different style from the main narrative. It is, in Scott's highly elusive, easygoing, digressive manner, what he called his smart style, whereas the main narrative is much thinner in allusions and images than is usual in the Waverley novels. Apart from being set in France, its connection with the narrative is not immediately apparent, except for the discovery right at the end in the castle of Aulieu of some family memorials which had fortunately been preserved and which contained some curious particulars respecting the connection with Scotland which first found me favour in the eyes of the Marquis de Aulieu. This is the imaginary source of the narrative which follows, but virtually nothing more is heard at the memorials. There's a brief, rather playful reference to them in chapter 12, so they can't be among the major points of the introduction. Three possible major points have occurred to me though there are very likely others. In the first place, and most obviously, the contrasting style of the introduction throws into relief the spare, restrained, analytical nature of the narrative which we've noted. Secondly, the introduction prepares the way for the opening historical sketch by giving, in effect, a selective history of France during the period between the 15th century and the present day. We encounter, though not in chronological order, Sully, Louis XIV, Louis XV, the Revolution and the émigré, and the Bond Noir. Thirdly, and I am currently inclined to think most importantly, the introduction depicts a gradual movement by which the narrator gains progressive knowledge of an interesting and somewhat elusive character and the chateau which is his seat. This anticipates Quentin's experience and the reader's experience with the much more complex Louis XI and his neurotically impenetrable castle of Plessis-les-Tours. 
Thus prepared, the reader arrives at chapter one with its very different style. At first sight, it seems to be crystal clear. A historical sketch followed by contrasting characterizations of Louis and Charles. But these characterizations are by no means straightforward matches. Louis occupies three pages in the Edinburgh edition, Charles hardly more than one. And most of Charles's meagre allocation is actually taken up with the relationship between himself and the king. Again, we are being prepared for the following narrative, in which Louis is infinitely more complex and interesting than Charles. This contrast is summed up in one paragraph in the Peron section. The coucher of King Louis is more worthy of notice than that of Charles, for the violent expression of exasperated and headlong passion, as indeed it belongs more to the brutal than the intelligent part of our nature, has little to interest us in comparison to the deep workings of a vigorous and powerful mind. Scott was acquainted with a wide range of interpretations of Louis's character. The Edinburgh edition sums them up like this. Louis has been subject to an immense range of interpretations, from Comines' carefully balanced account, drawn from first-hand acquaintance, and Jean de Roy's diary of Louis's reign, misleadingly known as the Scandalous Chronicle, through virulently hostile neo-feudal sources, such as Claude de Seyssel and Brantome, Mézaret's pioneering but still hostile study of 1643-51, to 51, and Varghia's panegyric of 1689, the balanced and scholarly Duclos in 1746, and the severe Raxhall in 1777. Modern authorities are at much as loggerheads, by the way. In that opening chapter of the novel, the narrator calls Louis evil, but tellingly with a striking qualification. His character, evil as it was, met, combated, and in a great degree neutralised the mischiefs of the time, as poisons of opposing qualities are said in ancient books of medicine to have the power of counteracting each other. Scott's presentation of Louis maintains the reader's interest by the king's constant multifaceted unpredictability and by his unfailing ability to surprise. It is significant that when Quentin recovers from his first surprise on recognising that Maitre Pierre and Louis are the same, he studied the king's appearance more attentively and was surprised to find how differently he construed his deportment and features. Louis is a consummate dissembler and performer, particularly in his entertaining of Crèvecoeur and Cardinal Ballou, after which the light of assumed vivacity had left his eyes, the smile had deserted his face, and he exhibited all the fatigue of a celebrated actor when he has finished the exhausting representation of some favourite character. There are times when he is a puzzle to himself. I should be as well contented as thyself, Dunois, to tell thee my purpose, did I myself but know it exactly. 
In the introduction to the Magnum edition of Quentin Durward in 1831, Scott offers a much cruder and almost unrelievedly dark interpretation of Louis. But in the first edition, readers have to be alert all the time as they try to keep up with the twists and turns of one of Scott's most fascinating characters. The presence of such a compelling character means that the other characters pale in comparison. They are at most two-dimensional, Le Balafre, Hayraton and Comin, and mostly one-dimensional, notably, or rather unnotably, the very young, though often remarkably canny, Quentin. Inevitably, the narrative loses sharpness and becomes rather monochrome when Louis is off stage, as he is for most of the second volume. But it does not flag, and there is at least one unforgettable scene in the murder of the Bishop of Liège. Finally, I'd like to offer two comments on the end of the novel. The first of these derives from an extraordinary letter from Scott to James Ballantyne, written in March 1823. I am very glad you like the sheets of Quentin Durward. They will improve as they go on, and the story shall be simple and intelligible, yet with much bustle and event. But, my lad, must, I fear, remain a lad, for the story will only occupy a month at most. I am obliged to leave out the Battle of Moir. But a long farewell to Nancy, I mean the Battle of Nancy, not the damsel. But what I most of all regret is the death of Louis XI. Indeed, so much do I regret it, that I will perhaps employ the next three volumes in killing him my own way. I find that astonishing. The final build-up to the attack on Liège in the published work seems wholly inevitable, in keeping with the prevailing narrative discipline. And it is difficult to imagine how Scott might have extended the time scale from 1468 to Charles' defeat and death at Nancy in 1477. In the event, Nancy is the last in the sequence of battles that end the spacious narrative in Anne of Gerstein six years later. As for Louis, he is active in the later novel, but wholly in the background, and his miserable final illness and death had to wait until the magnum introduction to Quentin Derwood in 1831, sealing its dark characterization. The instructive but appalling scene of this tyrant's sufferings was at length closed by death, 30th of August, 1483. Scott brought his 1823 narrative to a neat conclusion with the twist by which William de Lamarck is killed by Le Balafre rather than Quentin before transferring the reward of Isabel's hand to his nephew and paving the way for Crevecoeur's final remark but why should I grudge this youth his preferment, since after all it is sense, firmness, and gallantry which have put him in possession of wealth, rank, and beauty? In an undated note to Ballantyne, accompanying the final sheets of manuscript, Scott wrote 
I send you the conclusion with an apology, talis qualis, for not making more of a conclusion. Valentine objected to this abrupt conclusion, and in response, Scott added a few lines with a coy refusal to go into the details of medieval wedding ceremony. This brief added coda, with its references to the rhyme of the ancient mariner, Pope, Shenston, and Ariosto, can be seen as echoing the elusive style of the introduction, so that the narrative has a matching top and tail. And there is a further match. Scott includes in the introduction a fresh and highly entertaining variant of his biggest joke, his anonymity game, in The Bridal of Lammermoor, Chevalier Scott section. The modern reader, with the appropriate background knowledge, can appreciate that the added coda is also fundamentally a joke, this time at Valentine's expense. The printer is characterised as a friendly monitor, one of those who like the lump of sugar which is found at the bottom of teacup, as well as the flavour of the souchong itself. And although Scott has responded with an added conclusion, its answer to Ballantyne's request is in effect a decisive no. The original ending is firm, in line with the narrative as a whole. No useful purpose would be served by finding loose ends to tie up. What Scott has written, he has written. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I find it very novel um, attending, well, it's effectively the cinema to hear somebody <laughs> talking about Scott, so very novel and very enjoyable, um, and our thanks to our first speaker for a thought-provoking provoking and, and detailed commentary of, of the novel. So it's my delight to introduce our second speaker this afternoon, Leslie Graham. Leslie is Senior Lecturer in the Department of Languages and Cultures at the University of Bordeaux. She's written extensively on Scottish literature, especially Robert Louis Stevenson, and I believe is currently editing a volume of poetry for the um, new Edinburgh edition. And she's past president of the French Society for Scottish Studies, and we're absolutely delighted that she's been able to join us this afternoon, and very much looking forward to hearing your talk. So welcome, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Lucy, and uh, thank you very much to the, uh, the club, and especially to Mikey Wood, for inviting me along uh, today to talk about uh, Quentin Durward. Um, so I've taken as my title uh, Quentin Derward or L'Histoire de France Walter Scotty, and we'll see the, um, the origin of that quotation um, a little bit later on. So this year marks the bicentenary of the publication of uh, Quentin Derward, not just in English but also in, Fre in French. Um, in 1822, uh, Charles Gosselin, uh, the Parisian publisher, managed to get an agreement um, from Scott's publisher in English, to allowing him to issue uh, French translations simultaneously, quasi simultaneously at least, with the original English versions. And from then on, uh, French editions of new Scott novels were released at the same time as the originals. Um, Auguste uh, Jean-Baptiste de Faucon-Pré, who came to be considered um, as Scott's official translator in France, produced no fewer than four translated versions of Quentin Durward between 1823 and 1832. And my intention today is to talk about the French reception 
and the afterlives of Quentin Durward, or perhaps I should say Quentin Durward, since the vast majority of readers in France read uh, the novel in French. The novel's reception in Britain was relatively lukewarm, but French readers who were already convinced Scotophiles went wild for it. Content du Ovalde arrived on the French market at a time when the book trade was expanding very rapidly due to modern printing techniques, policies, government policies promoting uh, literacy, uh, which led to an increased number of competent readers, and also the more widespread mastery of the French language rather than patois. So one of the rare authors to be read in the provinces as well as in Paris, Walter Scott played a vital role in promoting the novel as an object of consumption for ordinary people um, throughout France and soon became an integral part of French literary culture. Scott was undoubtedly aware of the better sales figures in France when, in 1830, he reassessed his original opinion of the novel to Robert Cadell, his publisher. He, uh, he wrote, I thought it one of the worst of the set, but upon going over it, I think it is a good one, though rather for the foreign market. This was the first of the Waverley novels to take place on the European continent. Um, in France during the reign of Louis XI in the, 18, in, the four, sorry, in the 1460s and during what Scott called in a letter an admirable little corner of history. This little corner of history was particularly attractive to Scott because the period can be considered a turning point at which the modern French state was formed, fascinating in its own right but also arguably the seed of the tumultuous events that had taken place in France during Scott's lifetime, namely the French Revolution. For Scott and his contemporaries, France was synonymous with revolution. They had witnessed the fall of the Ancien Régime and the rise of the bourgeoisie to power. Very much al aligned with the same traditional Tory values as those promoted by French legitimism after 1815, Scott never ceased to reaffirm his indignation at revolutionary violence, voiced notably in his Life of Napoleon, published just four years after um, Quentin Durward in 1827. Charles Naudier, perhaps Scott's most fervent admirer in France, wrote that Scott belonged to toutes les anciennes doctrines sociales. The correspondence between the crisis of chivalry in, 15th century, uh, in the 15th century and the overthrow of the French aristocracy in the revolution is explicitly expressed in the novel. Quentin Durward then is about violence, brutality, and pointless cruelty, the demise of chivalry. It's about degenerate leadership, about the ugliness of civilization in mutation. It's about the rise of the importance of individual experience. And Susan Manning perhaps puts it, it, puts it best when she notes that Scott's largest subject is the forging of a new order from the decaying ruins of the old. And she adds that his French works, such as Quentin Durward, allowed him, and I quote, to explore the less, pal less palatable aspects of this desperate transitional upheaval. Throughout them, chivalry is characterized by extremes which, in seeking to exalt human nature unnaturally, destabilize it and expose the brutality which in Scott's writing lurks always within excessive idealism. The unsettling influence of the Machiavellian Louis XI is present throughout the novel. In French, he even insinuates 
his way into the title, since the novel was first published with the title in French, with the title Quentin Durvard ou l'Écossais à la cour de Louis XI. Interest in the 15th century, King was at its height um, in the early 19th century. He was a fascinating embodiment of Gallic anti syzygy a mix of criminal deviance and religious devotion, superstition and realism. He was both the last medieval king, an emblem of tyranny, superstition and barbarism, and the first modern king, who thanks to a rising bourgeoisie, was able to ensure both the unity of the kingdom and economic prosperity. Scott had several ties with France. His wife, as we know, Charlotte, née Charpentier, was French, and French sources fed into the novel in various ways. He had visited Paris in 1815, soon after the Battle of Waterloo, and had written about it to great acclaim in Paul's letters to his kinsfolk. The first translation of Quentin Durward advertises this much more journalistic volume on one of its title pages, as you can see here, suggesting that readers might read the work to better understand Scott's descriptions of uh, Belgium and Liège in particular. Scott's most important historical sources were the memoirs of uh, Philippe de Comines, um, which were written between uh, 1489 and 1498, which Scott possessed and read in the original French. Comines is regarded as the first practitioner of modern analytical history. Sainte Beuve called him the first truly modern writer. He had acted as counsellor for both Louis XI and his arch rival, another important character in the novel, Charles the Bold or Charles le Téméraire, Duke of Burgundy. Scott's depiction of the former, which strongly, no, de Comines' depiction of Louis XI, uh, which strongly influenced Scott's own, is notably more balanced than those offered by rival historians and chroniclers. Now, one of the ways in which the modern reader can gauge attitudes to a work in translation is through the footnotes, which, through their, either their suppression or their addition, often betray the translator's beliefs about the way in which the work in question will be received by the reading public. The translators, and sometimes the publishers, notes in um, Quentin Durward are particularly interesting when they express an opinion on the novel's representation of French history. I don't have time to go into a study of all of the footnotes, but we can have a look at the final footnote, which attempts to justify the addition of certain preceding um, footnotes. So you have the final footnote here in uh, French and it's in English on uh, the right. Um, it, um, it capitalizes on what seems to be considered a more direct knowledge of French history among French, a French readership, but excuses Scott at the same time, since he is, after all, a novelist and not a historian. So the final uh, footnote reads, Le roman de Quentin Durward étant une véritable excursion mm. sur notre sol et dans notre histoire, l'éditeur s'est permis de relever par des notes plusieurs fautes, peut-être volontaires, de romanciers. Il croit devoir rappeler ici que Sir Walter Scott cherche plutôt à peindre en artiste le caractère moral et le costume général d'une époque qu'a raconté en froid analyste les événements disposés selon la chronologie. Now, similar reservations about Scott's treatment of France in his non-fiction work were later found their way into Sainte Beuve's obituary of Scott, which was published in Le Globe in September um, 1832. And he writes, La France a eu de sévères reproches à lui adresser au sujet des jugements étranges dont il a rempli les lettres de Paul et l'histoire de Napoléon Bonaparte. Mais c'était de sa part légèreté, 
et prévention d'habitude, bien plutôt que mauvais vouloir et système. One of the reasons evoked by Scott himself for the shift away from British shores to France for the plot of Quentin Durward was the hope that he would no longer be copied by what he called the vulgar dogs of imitators. But he had not reckoned with the very many French imitators who were only too happy to follow him to historical French settings. Quentin Durward had a marked and lasting influence on French historiography and on French cultural life in general. Scott was an invigorating and renewing force on the French literary scene, and he was emulated by hordes of secondary writers in France, whose names have all now been forgotten, but also by writers who are still widely read today. In 1828, saint beuve again declared that this was an epoch in which the imitation of Walter Scott was almost a necessary contagion even for the very highest talents. And sometimes that imitation was, quite frankly, plagiarism. And I'd like to concentrate on the individual reactions of three writers to Comtan du Ovalde in the next section of my talk, and they are Victor Hugo, Alfred de Vigny and Honoré de Balzac. In a much cited article that appeared very shortly after the publication of Quentin Durvard in French, Victor Hugo heaped praise on Scott. He writes, uh, sorry, I've got this in French and in English as well, I just have to... Oh. Uh, there we are. Nul romancier n'a caché plus d'enseignement, plus de charme, plus de vérité sous la fiction. And then continued, um, quant à nous, nous remplissons un devoir de conscience en plaçant Walter Scott très haut parmi les romanciers, et en particulier Quentin Durward très haut parmi les romans. Quentin Durward est un beau livre. Il est difficile de voir un roman mieux tissu, à des effets moraux, mieux attaché aux effets dramatiques. The article finishes with Victor Hugo setting out what he sees as the task ahead for future novelists and therefore for himself. He writes, uh, and I'll, I'll read this one in English. After Walter Scott's picturesque but prosaic novel, there remains another novel to be created, more beautiful and more complete still in our opinion. It is the novel, both drama and epic, picturesque but poetic, real but ideal, true but great, which will enshrine Walter Scott in Homer. And in his own writing, Hugo is generally considered to have exceeded in going further on the challenging path carved out by Scott. He did this partly through emulating Scott. Notre Dame de Paris borrows from several Waverley novels, including Quentin Durward. Hugo's uh, novel was published in 1831 but its roots go back to the 15th of November, 1828, when Victor Hugo signed a contract with Scott's Parisian publisher, Charles Gosselin, undertaking to, de to deliver specifically a novel in the style of Walter Scott. The original contract provided for delivery of the novel in April, 1829. And like Scott, Hugo did not consider himself bound to respect historical truth at all costs, and did not hesitate to alter the details of the facts and tighten up the plot to bring out the character of historical figures such as Louis XI more clearly, or to emphasize his own vision of history. In so doing, he applied to his novel the principles set out in his 1823 article on Quentin Durvald, in which he had declared I prefer to believe in the novel rather than in history because I prefer moral truth to historical truth. And moving on to Alfred uh, de Vigny. It was generally accepted by critics such as Sainte-Beuve 
Stuart Mill, and 10, that Alfred de Vigny had been influenced by Scott in his novel Cinq Mars, although no one really tried to pinpoint the similarities until until Maigrant in 1898 identified some of the ways in which his historical novel was a novel a la Walter Scott. Victor uh, Francois in this article um, showed in another early article just how closely and how frequently Alf Alfred de Vigny had imitated Scott in the detail. Most of the fictitious details of the first part in Saint Mars are indeed adapted from Quentin Duvald, and there are numerous other borrowed situations and incidents from other Waverley novels. Francois provides detailed examples of uh, the borrowings, such as this one, where you have uh, Quentin Duvald on the left and Saint Mars on the right. And you have um, corresponding words such as rougissant and blushing, n'oublierons um, pas ce trait, forget thy brave bearing, which is bravo, and then we also have uh, modesty. However, De Vigny never appears never to have acknowledged his very clear debt to Scott. Honoré de Balzac was another fan of Scots and just as enthusiastic in his borrowing practices. The novel Lex Communie, which he started writing just after a year after the publication of uh, Quentin Durward, is awash with plagiarism from Scott's uh, novel. And this is just part of a table um, that appears in Aude de Ruel's um, uh, article in which she identifies borrowings in the first chapter of the novel, which was long thought to have been written by somebody other than uh, Balzac because of its cumbersome style. However, when the manuscript was found, it showed that not only was it written by Balzac, but that it was also the most heavily worked on passage in the, in the book. So why did Hugo, Balzac and de Vigny plagiarise, borrow from, and so freely from Quentin Durward? Well, according to Maigrant, the French reading and writing public were conflicted. They were disappointed that such an attractive French subject had not been treated by a Frenchman or woman, but also flattered that their national history had merited the attention of as great a novelist as Scott. In short, by leaving the history of Scotland and England for that of France, Quentin Durward offered the advantage of presenting a ready-made reference for, to use a Stevensonian phrase, sedulous apes wishing to paint a picturesque history of their own country and history. In parallel uh, with these literary adaptations, Quentin Durward was also a great inspiration in French painting. Eugène, Eugène uh, de la Croix was particularly influenced uh, by the novel, producing at least three works inspired by the plot. Uh, the best known of which is this 1829 painting, L'Assassinat du Duc de Liège. Another of uh, Delacroix's studies, dating from around the same uh, period, is this one on the right, entitled Comte du et le Balafré. Among the less well-known, perhaps even forgotten artists, Louis Riquier, um, here, who was Belgian but often worked in Paris, painted Quentin Duvard et Louis XI, and Gillo saint evre painted Louis XI et Isabelle de Croix, Saint de Quentin Duvard. Uh, Jean-François Théodore Gechter produced a bronze um, sculpture. Um, the original of which has been lost. This is a this is a copy at around uh, the same time, and a five act play produced by Mélie Janin, inspired by the novel and entitled Louis Ange à Péronne, was put on at the Théâtre Français in Paris on the fifteenth of February, eighteen twenty seven. So these are all works that were influenced by uh, Quentin Durand during the um, the eighteen twenties. 
By 1831, Balzac was much less positive about the writer he had so freely emulated. He writes in the preface to La Peau de Chagrin, which was published in 1831, that the public are fed up with a Walter Scotted history of France. They are rassasiés de l'histoire de France ou Walter Scotty. There is little evidence that this was true. French readers continued to read Contin d'Auvard long after its publication. The borrowing figures from public libraries show that, for example, in Brive, as late as 1871, among its collection of just 1,005 books, the most frequently borrowed included Ivanoe, Contin d'Auvard, La Fiancée de la Marmour, Le Pirate, La Prison d'Edimbourg, and La Jolie Fille de Perth. <laughs> the novel continued its afterlives in the form of not one, but two uh, silent films in 1910 and 1912, directed by Albert Capellani and Adrien Caillat, respectively. And I haven't been able to find any stills from the, from the film, but this is the first uh, page of the, um, the scenario of the 1912 uh, version. In the second half of the 19th century and into the 20th century, first-rate French writers did stop emulating Scott, but the popularizations continued, and Scott's name gradually came to be associated with popular, mostly juvenile literature. Many editions of uh, Contin d'Auvard um, were abridged versions simplified uh, for children, uh, like this one here, and throughout the, the 20th century, we find uh, Contin d'Auvard in school uh, reading books, um, such as this one, where there is an explanation of the vocabulary, but the vocabulary in uh, French. And um, here as well is a page from a graphic novel from uh, 1955 in um, a magazine called Ten -ten. However, the version of the novel that most French people of a certain age today remember is the Franco-German television series Contin d'Auvard, the seven episodes of which were directed by Gilles Grangier. It was first uh, broadcast in early 1971. Now, it may not be a coincidence that this series was produced less than a decade after the end of the Algerian War, which ran from 1954 to 1962, and so soon after the student uprising in France in, 19, in May 1968. Both events, which to many French viewers, must have felt pivotable in the same way as the French Revolution had felt momentous to Scott, each having um, been uh, pretended to some extent by the boorishness and violence of the reign of Louis XI and the end of the age of chivalry. Today, Scott in general and uh, Contin d'Auvard in particular are much less widely read in France. And yet, modern French readers might see in its story of a society in the throes of violent mutation a foreshadowing of the popular uprisings that have unsettled its streets in recent months, and they might have responded to echoes of the wanton cruelty of wars being fought not so far from home, in which organized companies of mercenaries seem to be playing at least an, as important a role as Quentin Durward in the 15th century. Perhaps it's time for a remake. Thank you very much. journey through Quentin Durward from the personal and political context that brought Scott to perhaps writing the novel to the many different forms of, of afterlives as you've demonstrated for us this afternoon and I know I'm going to be looking to see if I can find a copy of this. <laughs> uh, so, so I'd like to now uh, open the floor for any questions that anybody might have for Leslie this afternoon. Yes. 
Um, a credit to the creativity of Walter Scott is that you could have locked them up in a monk's cell with two ancient books, and from that, within a hundred days, he could have come up with something astonishingly but charming, edifying, and all the rest. My focus question is, um, how and now do we know from his library how did Scott acquire um, the, these memoirs, these astonishing books of resource, which nobody would have thought would be worth anything other than pulping? The memoir de Fuy de Comines, for example, how would he have had that in his library? Um, the simple answer is, I, um, I don't know. Um, I, does anybody know how he came to have it in his library? We, we do know that um, I've done a little bit of work on uh, Paul's letters to his kinsfolk, and uh, we know that um, after um, visiting uh, the field of battle at Waterloo, where he picked up a lot, a lot of memorabilia, that he continued picking up um, memorabilia and perhaps books as well. Um, but when he came to Paris, um, he was he was still shopping. He was uh, he was he was buying things. But I, I, I honestly don't know if that is where he picked up um, Philippe de Comines uh, memoirs. Maybe Leslie, the lady at the library who's done the cataloging, um, so, you know, because mm. you said he's got astonishing books of ours and also had talks about that mm. before. But how books come to be a man's library at a point in time um, always tells us lots. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and we can imagine that he already had this interest in 15th century French history uh, when, he bought, when he actually bought, uh, bought the book. So, yeah, the book didn't trigger the interest. The interest uh, undoubtedly triggered the, yeah. And to come back to your comment on um, th that capacity to be able to come up with such a fantastic novel in just three months uh, is very true, but what the capacity on the part of the translator as well, to be able to translate three volumes in such a short time so that it came out almost simultaneously um, in Great Britain and in, and in France. Um, you say that the, the, the publisher Gosselin effectively got the rights of uh, mm. Walter Scott novels with this novel in 1823. How did they get the text to, uh, to the translation of France in the form of proofs or manuscript or whatever? And secondly, uh, did Scott make any money out of this? <laughs> Did, did Scott make any money out of the freight? Yes, that, that's an, uh, another question on publishing history that I that I that I really don't know the the answer to. But I think that as that first quote where he where he says, "Oh, I didn't think it was that good a novel, but now I've come round to thinking that that it is a good one, but but more for the foreign market." So he is aware that there is a foreign market and that um, um, and that and the, the the novel is selling well on that on that foreign market. And yes, I mean, surely, uh, if Gosselin was negotiating to be able to bring out translations so quickly, he must also have been negotiating uh, the financial aspects um, of the of the of the deal. Yeah. Do you know at all how many other Scott novels had already been? I know it was mm. always translated very early on already mm. into all sorts of European languages. It was very, very popular mm. in various um, So it mm. presumably wasn't the first. No, it, was, it, no, it definitely wasn't. Uh, definitely wasn't the first. Um, I think that all of the all of the Waverly novels up until then had been uh, had been public had been published in French uh, as well, and the name Scott was uh, was already known. Even in um, 1815, the, through the poetry, the name Walter Scott was known in Paris, and he was feted and lionized um, in Paris when, when, when during the, the weeks that he that he spent there. Just just to follow up on that final point then. <coughs> both in the title pages and reviews, there was no pretense of anonymity with Scott in the French editions. Uh, not at that point, no, no, no. Yeah, right. um, although there are, I'm not 100% sure, that title page that I showed, I'm not sure that that was the first translation because there were four translations and there has been some work done on comparing the, the four uh, translations. The last translation obviously is the Magnum Opus uh, edition, so that's completely, well, it's 
different in, to the extent that the, the, the Magnus Opus edition is different from the original edition, but it's not quite clear to me why de Faucompré felt the need to do three translations. Probably because he had to do the first one so quickly. Um, so the so so that title page that I showed you may not be from the 1823 edition. It was from the and yeah, so there was no pretense. Yeah. On the on the French editions, do you know what they charged for those? Because generally the French novels are a lot cheaper than the British ones. And there was a danger from the British booksellers yeah. or publishers that people would buy a French copy and read it in the French. Ah, yes. <laughs> okay. Very people who can afford to buy books could, could do that. If you could buy it for half the price. <laughs> That's very clever, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but they would have had to come over to Paris to buy it. Well, yeah. I don't know, because well, it happened both of uh, the transatlantic trade where the Americans would publish cheap editions yes. because they weren't mm. paying the full copyright, mm. they would pay a small amount. Yeah. But the French would probably just be paying a token amount as well uh, for the translation rates mm. because there's no international copyright at the time. Um, so a lot of the ones published in America would make their way back, so truth could make their way back across the channel. Across the channel, uh, yes. And indeed Ireland, would, mm. particularly the Dublin trade, would uh, pirate books um, and send them and back yes, as well. Because yes. uh, they're worth copying, because mm. they're, they're valuable commodities. Yes, that's interesting. I mean, certainly the French edition was used for um, translations into other languages, because for, for, into Russian, for example, French was more uh, a more accessible language um, at that time than uh, than English was. Uh, um, but as for the yes, uh, I don't know whether that was that was a, that was perceived as being a problem. It was one of the reasons why publishers started to develop uh, illustrations for books because they were much more expensive to copy. People wanted the <coughs> illustrations in the books. Uh, yes, yeah. Well, certainly, I, mean, I, I know more about the publishing history of Stevenson, and certainly that was uh, the case with Stevenson. The first illustrated uh, version of Treasure Island in English used the French illustrations, mm. um, and the, the and they they really don't fit with the with the narrative. Um, <laughs> Jim Hawkins is wearing clogs, for example, <laughs> uh, as he would have been, and I think they had to blank out more else rather than than in yeah. So it was something that carried on right into. The, the 1870s. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my mind's going, I, I, I'm just thinking through the revelation mm. or the possibility that um, Balzac was influenced by uh, Sir Walter, which is mm. amazing. Uh, I, I'm just thinking through uh, the, the book you mentioned, I don't, is that mm. part of the comedy humane? And, and how much did the water scope influenced mm. uh, Balzac. I mean, Le Chon. to that performance. Um, but no, uh, Le Chon, I think, was his first yes. novel of uh, the comedy. Yes. Uh, are those novels and uh, all that range of novels mm. uh, influenced by? Well, I mean, I, I'm giving you this second hand. I haven't actually looked at those novels. I've looked, depended on other scholars who have looked at them in great, great detail. And perhaps I should have mentioned that um, that the Balzac novel Le Cinq Mars was not actually published in his uh, lifetime. He did write it um, in the year following the publication of uh, Quentin Durward, but it wasn't published in his lifetime. So we can think of him, you know, as as practicing, as using um, Scott as 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 a model, and and yes, it, it wasn't published. So he was influenced, but yeah, we'd have to. Well, have a, the shop is very much uh, a historical novel. I think it's the first one. That I've yes, it yeah. It's laser coin. Mm. But uh, mm. that was a very historical novel. Yes. And it's kind of the music that it caught us out. Isn't a historical novel. Yes, history. yeah. And forgive my bad French. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's an interesting point, and again, well, there's, just there's a, looking through this now. Uh, yeah, the, the, of course, there's a massive, a massive literature on on absolutely. Balzac as well, and yeah, um, um, especially on the on the manuscripts, some of which have only come to light relatively, uh, relatively <coughs> recently. But yes, it's Scott. It's very okay. Thank you. Now, for one o'clock, and this given us a rather terrifying reminder of time, there, but I know there were two further questions, so if we could take them. Just, just a quick one. Um, out of interest, the, the actual process of translation, mm -hmm. did the translators try and mimic the style of Scott? Because, I mean, it's arguable that Scott 
uh, is not as popular as it maybe should be because some of the style in English now has become relatively archaic. Yes. And um, the French style, I've read, I, I read a lot of French books, mm. so I was quite interested, uh, you know, if you read Balzac, mm. he's often used as a pithy, short uh, phrase, mm. when in English we tend to maybe use a few more words. French are mm. quite into that, I'm sure you'd accept that. So, What's the stylistic approach from the translators? Well, the, the De Fou Compris yeah. uh, translations are in the same style as uh, as Scott. They're very much uh, of their of their age. Um, but there have been more modern translations um, since then. Uh, when I, I was brought up in Pennycook, and we have had an exchange with a town called Lille sur Sorgue, and when the um, the pupils came over from Lille sur Sorgue, they all had a French copy of Waverly um, that they had been given, and they were expected to have read that before coming to Scotland, so that they would have an idea of what Scotland was going to be like. <laughs> I, I certainly wasn't reading. Um, I wasn't reading Scott, and I, I think that the, I, I, most of them it was well thumbed for the first ten pages. <laughs> uh, not so much, but yes, it, it is the. It's a, it's a style that is uh, is pretty heavy. Uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, understandable. Yeah. yeah. We're going to do one final question. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, quick one. Sorry, to stray away from publishing history, but. Uh, Scott and the Lad of Pants. Now, now Quentin Durwood is the great Lad of Pants. And I think the, your predecessor on the zoo was saying Crevecoeur's final thing, well, gallantry gets you the girl at mm. the end of the day. Yes. But earlier on in the book, Crevecoeur does this fantastic put down mm. of Quentin Durwood when he's bragging about his lineage and all that mm. and says, look, it's only rank, power, and money which matter in this yes. world. So shut up, you Scottish git. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a big put down. <coughs> The Lad of Pats, which I thought Scott was very much one of the promoters yes. of the poor boy from the valleys or mm. the glens. Well, I don't know. What, what, what matters most? Is it the result or is it the process of getting to the result? He gets what he wants um, as, as, a, as a lad of pairs, doesn't he? Really, he gets the, the hand of Isabel. Um, he's well established and he's, he's, he's especially morally. I think that I mean, the central question is. It, him being torn between um, two possible masters, and perhaps more naturally, he would have gone towards Charles de Temeraire rather than Louis XI. But through his chivalrous attitude um, and his sense of duty, he goes into the service of Louis XI. So yes, I, it, it is. It's it's much more complex than if you tell if you tell the story. It seems very simple. Boy comes to France, boy <laughs> has uh, several adventures, and in the end uh, marries the heroine. But it actually, it's much, much more uh, complex than, than it seems to be. And, and I, I don't know about you, but I, I, think he's, I think he's quite a bland character. He doesn't really have a lot of personality, does he? Or, or, or am I alone in thinking that? He's not. He's spirited, but he doesn't, he's not original. He's you know, he's a he's a vehicle for for Scott's ideas rather than being a real fully formed character. I might say. Like every other yeah. yeah. Possibly, yes, <laughs> yes. An archetype rather than a than a character. Yeah, perhaps. Or, or perhaps it's a vehicle that is used by Walter Scott quite a few times. Um, yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh, yeah. Well, firstly, thank you so much for answering those questions so so generously, and thank you very much for your talk as well. But to give you proper thanks, I'd like to introduce uh, David Mulcahy, who's going to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Lucy, and I, I think I'm going to catering is hovering outside, so I'll try and keep this brief, but it would be inappropriate not to give due thanks to uh, you, first of all, as the audience for attending, and we do need an audience to make these things work, so uh, thank you for carving out the time, and I'm sure busy festival schedules uh, to come along. Um, and thanks also to Lucy for chairing today, um, and also to Lee for not only managing two different types of technology, I was on a cold sweat just thinking about um, being in the audience, never mind making it work, and it was great that that was all for us, but for organising the tickets and everything else. And of course to Michael, who uh, did the original invitations uh, to set this all up. Our main thanks, of course, are to our two speakers. Uh, I'll deal with the answer T1 first. Uh, 
Dr. Alexander, Ian, um, I think, gave us a perfect setup uh, to the colloquium. Reminded us of the importance of structure to Scott's novels. Um, I, I had picked up the chapter headings coming in at that stage. It was a really nice uh, reminder of the importance of that, as was the importance of the introduction um, in Scott's books, mm -hmm. uh, and not to be skipped over, um, <laughs> even the, the cumulative ones uh, through the different editions and uh, through to the Magnus Opus. Um, but we also had that beginning, middle, and end as well. Um, and I think what, what stood out for me um, is this really uh, tactful way in which he managed to draw out just how good a character sketch and character depth he was able to produce with Louis uh, the Eleventh. I, I think really one of Scott's best characters. He does baddies as well as heroes, and I think uh, we sometimes forget that. And uh, our final comments there that actually uh, the main title character himself is somewhat. Double. really do the 11th, I think, that drives uh, the narrative, and I think uh, Ian explored that very well. Um, moving on uh, to Dr. Graham. Leslie, thank you so much for coming to Edinburgh. Um, absolutely worth a visit, I know, from the audience perspective. Hopefully you've enjoyed uh, talking uh, to us and participating in the questions which you handled so well. It was a revelation to me. Um, you managed to expand beyond text of the work really into its history, not just uh, that incredibly important time um, in the 20s and 30s when Scott was such an influence, and I think I'd probably underestimated you simply uh, brought a few things to light which I uh, didn't, didn't fully appreciate before, and um, really taking it into the 1960s and 70s and indeed uh, to contemporary society today. I quite agree with you that uh, he's worth another revised uh, take on it, uh, be that an artistic, filmic, uh, cinematic, um, or another uh, kind of text one. Um, you, you also gave me one of my favourite quotes, which I've, uh, I've written down, uh, it was the Victor Hugo one, uh, about him um, uh, teaching more uh, and hiding it and so on. And, uh, that was, I can't read my own writing, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you, you filled it with so many uh, wonderful things to take away uh, and kind of digest. So our greatest thanks of the day um, is to you, Leslie. Thank you so much for coming and joining us, making really quite a memorable uh, uh, program. Thank you. Uh, any further, but I just want to give a quick rattle through of events that we've got coming up just as a wee reminder. So on the 14th of September we have Dr Anna Pilks speaking about Scott and the Northern Knights. The month after, on Thursday the 12th of October, that's in the Advocates Library for our joint lecture with the University of Edinburgh and, and that will be delivered by uh, Dr Valentina Bold. And then on the Thursday the 16th of November we've got the first of a double bill uh, to do with the speculative, uh, speculative society. So David McLean will be speaking to us here in the new club about Scott and the Spec Society. And then on Saturday the 18th of November, there's actually an option to go on a visit to the Speculative Society. So two really exciting events there as well. So just to be a reminder of all of those, as has already been mentioned, there'll be tea, coffee and sandwiches arriving any moment now. And yes, once again, thank you for being here. And thank you.